when we have built this model, how can we train it? This is probably the most critical point. Let me talk about it from here. You may find it complicated with a DNN. So I've created just one perceptron. For example, there is this company selling goods. Let's say that the company runs ads on YouTube, TV, and Facebook. For example, it ran ads of 130 on YouTube, 70 on TV, and 55 on Facebook this week, which generated sales of 221. So, now the company has this data. It must have this history of data. Our company has been running this much of ads since we started selling this product, and these proportions of ads sold this many units, and so on. For example, running ads in the 30, 30, 25 proportion, we sold 100 units. There should be data like this. With such data, the company wants to build a model that predicts the sales volume of the next week based on the proportions of the ads with it wants to run on YouTube, TV, and Facebook. To make it simple, let's say it makes a model with only one perceptron, the Udabad cost goes into X1, the TV cost into X2, and the Facebook cost into X3, and then weights are multiplied. Multiply the ad costs of YouTube, TV, and Facebook by their weights, and add them up. Here weight 1 means that it sells without any ads. That's what it represents. Even if we put OS in all, we will multiply and add all of them. Even if we multiply W1 with the YouTube cost, and we put O here, a sales volume has to come out. This is where we put that. We provide the answers, and it will learn from differences between the answers. Let me clarify its objectives first. The objective is to find weights. With what weights for YouTube, TV, and Facebook? In the activation function, the model gave the accurate sales forecast. It is the goal to find the optimal weights. Then, how can we get them? Which for values should we put in W0, W1, W2, and WN to begin with? We will start with certain values and then slightly adjust them. This process of adjustment is called training. But there have to be initial values and weights to start training. But the computer has no data. So we will input some random values. We don't know anything yet. So let's put any values. We start with random numbers in W0, W1, W2, and William. When we enter ad costs with these random values, there should be some results, right? For example, let's say we've put one in all the fields from W0 to WM. Now we have results from all the ad costs. The forecast results wouldn't be accurate. We can't expect them to give an accurate forecast with just random values, because it literally has no idea. We will minutely adjust these random values from W0 to WM in order to achieve the accuracy that we aim for. What we do is we contrast the correct answers and the results from my neural network. And we adjust the values to reduce the differences. For example, my neural network has only one output here. But let's say this model is to give to numbers. That is, when it predicts to numbers, it gives one for men and one for women. My network says 100 will be sold to men and 80 to women. But let's say actually 105 was sold to men and 78 to women. You see the differences of 5 and 2 between 100 versus 105 and 80 versus 78. We need to put them together somehow. What if we just ate them all? Five more was sold to men, so it is plus five and minus two for women. It comes out three, which is a reduced value. To prevent offset, we square the values before adding them. Square them or average them. Then we have 29. This shows how poorly my network is performing as poorly as 29. 
What if this number becomes O? Becoming O means being the same as the correct answers. It means that the model predicted accurately. We want to make that 29 become O. What do we adjust? We want to adjust the weights from WO2 William to change the 29 to O. Now it brings up a question. I assumed that we start with 1, 1, and 1. To what value should we change the value from 1? Too much adjustment can lead to bigger differences. Change 1 to 1.1 1 .1 or 209. We will face this question. But we cannot just randomly change the numbers here and there from this number to that number. It will take forever, too. We need to apply some math here. How a function y is changed when a function x is slightly changed. Differentiation is calculating how the function y is changed when the function x is slightly adjusted. We use differentiation. Let's go back to a math class for differentiation. Differentiating w own means finding the slope of the tangent marked here in orange. It means the slope. If the slope of the tangent is minus 2, the negative value indicates the negative direction, that is 2, the left. Here w o was 1, and it moves to the left towards o, 9 and o, 8. The L here on the y-axis means the difference we got before. It stands for loss. If this loss moves w o to the left and the weight is reduced, it means the loss increases. The negative direction is to the left, the direction for the loss to increase. Number 2 means if the weight is adjusted by 1, the loss will be doubled. Let's have a closer look here. What did we say earlier? We wanted to change 29 to O. We wanted to decrease it. What do we need to do? We need to go to the positive direction, not to the negative direction. We get to move to the opposite direction of the direction that the derivative gives us. The definition of differentiation includes limits, so the adjustment has to be very slight. For example, going to the right means decrease. As the value goes to the right, the loss goes down. However, going too much to the right like this would make the value even larger. It is not necessarily true that going to the right always means decrease. Differentiation is to see the changes with tiny changes. The adjustment has to be very small. This approach is called gradient descent. Gradient means vector differentiation, and descent means we want to go to a direction of decrease. As this image shows, you can think of it as if we are blindfolded in the mountains and headed to the low point. We are not able to see where a low point is because we are blindfolded. All we have is the sense on your soul you can feel the slopes only. If we keep following the downslope, we will get to the lowest point in the end. This is the approach of gradient descent. So we have this equation. Let's say Wold is the initial values we gave. We gave a random value like 1. When we give a random value, we will change the value by this much. Subtract this much. What this means is, this part with the inverted triangle shows the gradient. It means the differential value. The loss is the value differentiated by the weight. The reason why we subtract is that the gradient points to the direction of increase. We need to move to the opposite to have it reduced. We subtract it to go to the opposite direction, that is, the direction of decrease. And then, if you see here, called learning rate, we multiply it. Because we want to give a tiny adjustment. Even with a little big gradient, we want to move a tiny bit. You can think of it as steps you take as you walk down the mountains. The size of the steps is adjusted by the learning rate. Usually we put very small values. This is not some kind of a magic number, but we usually put very small numbers like 10 to 3 or 10 to 5. 
In other words, if the difference between the new weights and the old ones is negative, it means it goes to the opposite direction of the gradient. The learning rate means it moves very little and it becomes the gradient. For example, if 1 became 09, Wald becomes 09. Find the gradient here again. As if we try to decide the next direction to go to after we have taken one step downhill in the mountain. We take one step downhill at a time. Once the weight is updated, the next one becomes world value, and it becomes the new new value. We need to input data each time. We need to do that to find the loss because we need to compare with the correct answers. There should be inputted data so that my network can give some results. It has to compare the differences between the results and the correct answers to get the loss. This loss has to be differentiated by W to update the weights. But we have a problem here. In deep learning, since we use a DNN, we need a lot of data. For example, let's say I've collected so much image data to input to build a quality model. Let's make it 100 million of data. I have 100 million images. Let's say I have 100 million images of cats and dogs each. That is a total of 200 million images. Then, when I input the data into my network and train it, what I do to find the loss is basically inputting all the 200 million images with 200 million correct answers ready. If I input 200 million images, it will produce 200 million prediction results. Then, it will compare 200 million predictions in my network with 200 correct answers to find the losses and usually average them. This averages the losses with the input of 200 million images. We differentiate them by the weights. Like the equation we saw before, the weights are changed very slightly like changing from 1 to 0, 999. And then, we input all the 200 million images again into this newly updated network. Then, now we have another 200 million results. With the 200 million correct answers, we come up with the losses again. Because we have updated weights, the losses will be different from the first ones. The correct answers remain the same, but my network has been changed slightly. Different results will come out, but the losses will be different. Find the losses, compare all the 200 million of them, average them, differentiate by the weights, and update the weights to 0,998. We input tons of data as the weights are slightly updated. This will be an extremely painstaking and slow job. So a new ID came up. Even though I have 200 million images, instead of using them all, can I use some of them by sampling somehow? Let me show you how. Using all the available data like the one I just demonstrated is called batch gradient descent. Getting the losses and averaging them all. This new method is called stochastic gradient descent, where you choose one sample only. You choose one image out of the 200 million and input the one image into the network. It will produce one result with one correct answer ready. You find the loss by comparing these two. This loss value tells you how well or poorly your network is doing its job. You update all the weights from the gradient with the loss. It's like this. We need to predict the average height of the Korean population. We pick one random person and measure the height. It is like we predict that this person's height is the average of Koreans. It is obvious that it is highly inaccurate. What can we do about that? Same with the survey. We don't survey every single person in Korea when we conduct an opinion poll. Using one piece of data will make the result too inaccurate, and using all the data will make the work too hard. So, we choose a reasonable number, like 100 or 200, and use them. If it's 100, we input 100 images and get 100 results. Compare them with 100 answers and find 100 lost values. Average them, and since they represent the 200 million images, we can update the weights accordingly. This is called mini batch gradient descent. We actually use this approach quite a lot. We use this mini batch gradient descent for most cases with the neural network. Let me put it another way. Inputting all the data, for example, if it's 200 million, inputting the 200 million all at once and finding the 200 million losses. Updating the weights from the 200 million losses. 
This is called batch gradient. Inputting one piece of the data, updating one weight at a time, it is called stochastic gradient. With 100 or 200 data, typically it goes by the to end like 64, 128, or 32 data when using a GPU. Working with some samples of the data is called mini batch gradient descent. When the weights are updated once in the mini batch, the update is called one step. For instance, if we have 1000 images in total and we use 100 images at a time, we will use up all the images after 10 results. One period in which we use up all the data is called one epoch. For example, with batch gradient descent, one step is the same as the one epoch. With stochastic gradient, if there are 1000 images, 1000 steps make one epoch. Like the example before, if we have a batch size of 100 images out of 1000 images, if we input 100 images at a time, 10 steps will make one epoch. This is how it works. The image on the right shows that although the one that would go pretty straight with batch gradient descent would zigzag with stochastic gradient, and also with the mini batch method, it has been experimentally proved it would eventually end up at almost the same point after many results. With this blue line, it has to perform 200 million calculations every step. With this one, it has to do only 100. With the purple line, it can calculate only one, so it makes some differences. It is less accurate, but goes faster. Now that we've covered everything else, let's go back. We know how to update weights. How many data to input, and that we can do this by the batch. It leaves us how we can find the gradient. We know we can do all this with the gradient, but how do we get it? To give a quick tip, we use an approach called back propagation. The diagram shows the method. Let's say the result from the network is A2, and the correct answer is Y. And then we find the loss using the difference between the two, and we want to minimize the loss. So, as an example, if you want to differentiate the loss to update this W11, it can be formulated like this. We want to get this, but the formula is pretty complicated. So, an easy way to do is what is called chain rule. Differentiate the loss by A2, differentiate A to by W21, differentiate W21 by Z11, and so on or differentiate the loss by A2, A2 by Z2, Z2 by G11, and so on. We take one step backward each time like this. Originally, the flow where the data come in this way and go all the way to the result is the forward. But the opposite is the backward step by step. Let me write down an example here. Differentiate the loss by A2 and multiply, differentiate A to by G2 and multiply. Differentiate Z to by E11. Differentiate A11 by Z11. Differentiate Z11 by W11. And these are all cancelled out. Then, it leaves the value the gradient from the loss by W11. Differentiating this way is called back propagation. You can search the internet or other sources for more information if you want to know further about it. To summarize it, we will provide a computer with data and correct answers. And let it find the rules on its own, instead of teaching it any rules. We input a bunch of cat and dog images, and when a cat image is inputted, we tell the computer that it's a cat. Or when a dog image is in, it's a dog. Then, later when we input a new image of a cat, we will make the computer capable of identifying it as a cat. To achieve that, we make a neural network like this. We input a cat image as data with a correct answer telling it's a cat. We will have a result as an output. The output will have a difference from the correct answer. Get the loss using the difference and try to minimize the loss. If the loss can be O, it means the computer can predict perfectly accurately. We train it by adjusting all the necessary weights to make the loss O. The process of adjustment uses gradients called back propagation and also multiplied by the learning rate. So far, we've covered the gradient descent method in the training. We began with what machine learning of deep learning is.
and discussed the process of its development to deep learning and the mechanism of the training. For the next session, we will learn about tensorflow and charis necessary for our practice.